we're on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the swamp. And please join me in welcoming Irish Granny Tarot. Oh, or, hi. I, you know, I noticed I spelt it wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, well. Do you see what I did? <laughs> I do. I wonder if I can fix it. I don't know. Let's see. Edit name. That's above my skill level. <laughs> hot <laughs> dog, I did it. I can't even spell. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're nice. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been watching this lovely lady for the longest time oh. and really enjoy your shows. I love your books. Thank you. The first time you got Greg Olier on, I nearly fell out of my chair. I was like, damn, how did you get him on the show? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little secret. I invite everybody. I've I've written to Margaret Atwood. I invite <laughs> everybody and I get it's throwing spaghetti on the wall. You hope one person somebody that I've done that a lot with some of the higher ups that have been in this for a while that are really big that I know uh, we had a new guy that a uh, college kid that popped into the community and he got Linda G on his show one day and a bunch of us were like, how the hell did you do that? And he said, I emailed her. Well, and it was like, wait a minute, you just sent her an email and she responded and he said, yeah, people everybody people, started emailing. You know, her. They're, they're just people. And most of the time, if they're not, um, horribly busy people are happy to do it i'm always oh, a little yeah. uncomfortable with people that are literary people authors po political people uh because <laughs> arrow you know scares people but greg does tarot cards every morning i didn't know that. i know i saw that in the that interview you did with him i was like i'll be damned i said no wonder i like him yeah yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, I listen to his podcast when I can, and I know he comes on. Uh, uh, what is it, Native? I think it is. With um, is a guy Australian? I think um, I can't remember. I'm going to his this. name. Yeah, I don't I know about you. Have to tell me. You have to. Um, send me the I'll have to look it up, and because um, I think it's like every Friday or Thursday or Friday or something. They do. Well, he, he does. has a YouTube show called the Five Eight. Yeah. Every Friday, with a woman named Lincoln's Bible. That yeah. was her her alias for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I like, first saw found him, she was with him. Yeah. On this other guy's show, so yeah. and they would come like every week. They would be on the show with him. And, really. Um, uh, oh. So I don't know if they both still go on the other guy's show all the time. Yeah. Or not. And yeah. I've gone completely blank on his name. So uh, you'll going. remember about three o'clock in the morning and call us all. And tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you an email. The name is blank, blank, blank. <laughs> well, don't send me an email because I'm one of these people. I, I'm not uh, surgically attached to my telephone and I forget to check my emails. <laughs> and you know, people will say, well, did you get my message? And then it gets lost in all these emails. You know, I just. Exactly. You know, well, I, you were one of the spaghetti on the wall that I threw. And ah. they just will respond. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you did, I was like, oh, yay. That may be the nicest <laughs> thing I've been compared to in a long time. <laughs> You're the one spaghetti on the wall that slid right <laughs> off and called me back. So. <laughs> But um, I've met so many wonderful people in this community. So it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm loving doing this. It's, it felt it's like when I first picked up the cards and started doing readings, it just felt like I was coming home. I was going to ask you, how, how long have you been doing it? How did you get involved in it? Um, I started watching in spring of 2020 when lockdown hit me too i me found too. diane's tarot and started watching her which led to um uh celtic tarot sheila celtic tarot yeah yep. started watching her which led to linda g which led to this one that one the other one and um for about the first six months i just watched and listened i didn't chat i didn't do anything because i i couldn't believe how nice everybody was to each other. It was like, okay, well, why not? I mean, <laughs> the cards are going to come out pretty soon. I'll just wait no, and see no. 
who's got the, the sharpest claws? And it never happened. And then one night I was watching, there was um, uh, these two ladies that used to do a show called, um, um, oh, now I'm going to go blank, uh, Tarot Lounge Tuesday, something like that. And it was just, they would throw cards and cut up and it was just a lot of fun. And I came home from work in a bad mood and their show was just coming on and <laughs> I hopped on to listen and they were talking about bras of all things. <laughs> well, when you're well endowed, you know, I had to throw my two cents worth in and got them both laughing. And then before I know it, um, they made me a moderator on their show. And then they invited me to come on the show and just come talk and say hello. Can I, can I ask you something? This is yeah. going to sound really stupid, but this is the level of my ignorance. What does a moderator do? A moderator has the ability to, um, they can put links in the chat that are active links. Like if you just go in a chat and put a link in there, it's not active. They would, somebody would have to like copy and paste it and put it in another okay, browser. Okay, so you may as well be speaking uh, ancient Greek right now. <laughs> I have no idea. I Like if you wanted to put your channel link in a chat, and you were just a regular guest, you know, just a regular listener in the chat, not a moderator, just a regular chat person. And you put your um, your channel address in the chat. It wouldn't be an active link. In other words, somebody couldn't click on it and go to your channel. It's just letters. But a moderator can go in and put that same link in the chat. Oh. And it's an active link. And then people can just click on it and zoom. It'll take them right to your channel. And then well, they can I check it out. And, I, I don't usually watch live chats. Yeah. Because I don't have the attention span to listen to what people are saying and read what's going by. It makes me absolutely make <laughs> spin. And well, I and I like listen at work. So it's like I'm a moderator on a lot of channels. Yeah. yeah. And so I'll have my, I've got it up on one monitor off to the side and I just listen. I usually have my earbuds plugged in, but I can kind of watch the chat. And if I see a troll pop up, then a moderator can get rid of a troll really fast. They can go in and have them removed um, so that they're not disrupting the chat and the show and everything. Because some of them are just annoying and some of them are out and out ugly um some are bots and some are just people looking to disrupt you know, who knows you know it's funny they don't bother me i don't get very many you know because i don't have very many viewers i don't get very many uh, people just, that are ugly but uh i always i they they amuse me i think i've raised children there's really not a lot you can say to me that i probably haven't already heard but exactly and i mean i just always either hit me mad enough i'll make a whole ship of sailors blush i mean <laughs> I just thank, them. thank you for watching and then, yeah. that's it yeah we usually several of us we try to just engage and say oh well that's an interesting topic would you like to come on air and discuss it <laughs> <laughs> they usually go away um you kind of know you're moving up the ladder when you get your first troll when they pop into the chat because you'll go for a long time and it's never an issue. And then all of a sudden they discover you and that's it. it they're there every time. There you are go. certain political topics that bring them out from under their rocks. Yes. And I forget now the name of the guy. I forget everything about him. He's one of these Bitcoin bros, you know, and I don't know much about that. I hardly ever talk about I don't about either. <laughs> Somebody asked me, so I, you know, did a reading and I got a whole string of people recommending him and defending him. And I just, you know, I don't care. <laughs> Hence, for entertainment purposes only, scrolling across the bottom of the screen. <laughs> because I've had, some, I've had some feedback from people who took what I said literally or seriously especially when i'm joking around um, yeah yeah because i tend to be a smart ass i don't mean to be but it just it just comes out <laughs> i can't well, there's help. not a lot of 
of irony or subtlety in YouTube. They it doesn't have that capacity, I don't think. I dealt with trolls uh the first year I did this, I got some <coughs> trolls and that you know, it was stupid, didn't bother me. But I decided to do a reading. So I dedicated a whole video to the tarot of being a troll. Like what did their cards show and why do people do that kind I of thing? That one. I'm have to go back and look for it. <laughs> yeah, it's in the first year that I did it because it seemed ironic to me. Uh, you know, every once in a while I'll get a message that this is demonic and I'm going to hell. And then oh, I yeah. always ask them, well, why are you watching? <laughs> yeah, well, why are you here? That just seems a little, you know, <laughs> contradictory. What's the point? If it's supposedly demonic, why are you here? <laughs> well, you know, people have to evangelize. You know, they have to go out there yeah. and proselytize. I know. I was spread. in that cult for a while. It's, it's been there, done that, wore the T-shirt. Thank God got rid of it. But... Uh, <laughs> burned it at the stake and said no more for you um so do you learn to read cards from watching other yeah. people doing it and did you ever have the interest or the i mean i'm sorry i'm interviewing you. that's okay you're, you're probably you better at it than i am i'm not real good at interviewing it's, so i tend to just say let's chat we'll just well, talk just about what comes up yeah did you have an interest when you were younger i'm curious you know if you had some kind of a relationship with metaphysics everybody like all the women in our family had the gift uh -huh. as it was put and when it was discovered that someone had it the modicum would be given oh you've got the gift period end of dis end of discussion yeah never talked about again uh when i was about four or five i would hear i called him god that's who i thought it was i heard a male voice talk to me i would talk back People would ask me, who are you talking to? I'd say, God. They'd be like, okay. <laughs> and just, <laughs> no big deal. Okay. <laughs> and I think Darth Vader, that's the kind of voice it was, that deep bass really? male voice. Wow. Wow. And um, as I got older, I, the first time I heard James Earl Ray, uh, uh, is that his name? James Earl Jones. Oh, he's got that beautiful voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the first time I heard him speak, I was like, oh, that's God's voice. <laughs> and then click. I hadn't thought about it in decades. Yeah. But that, that voice clicked it for me. And then over the years, little things would happen that, you know, I would just, I would know things. Or the first time I was proclaimed to have the gift was when I was nine. And we traveled three states we went from texas to florida to visit friends and when we walked in the house in the middle of the night after being asleep in the car most of the trip and the first words out of my mouth was oh i've been here before and everybody was like no you haven't i was like yeah i have this room is here and this one is here and this is this so-and-so's room and this furniture is in that room i described the entire house would you astral travel or something I, I have no idea. Um, wow. Wow. But my mother just looked at me and said, oh, you have the gift. And that wow. was it. She never said another word. When I was about 12, I discovered I could float outside of myself. Oh, wow. I could leave my body. I could like lay down in bed and I would just lay there and think about it. The first time it happened, it just kind of happened. It freaked me out. But I would like float on the ceiling. And look down at myself. Yeah, I've heard of that. But I wouldn't leave the room because I was terrified if I left, I would get lost and I wouldn't be able to find myself. You, not, you know now that can't happen, right? You're well, I know now, but at yeah. the time, 12 years old, I was like, yeah, I can't leave. What, what, what's going to happen to my body if that I get lost? That must have been so terrifying. It was fun, actually. <laughs> it was the thought of leaving was scary. Yeah. But to just hang out and float was kind of cool you know it was just i don't know I've, I've always been a gigantic chicken and have something like that happen to me i don't think i would have handled it very well i maybe maybe i would have you know i don't know but i just i never it, told anybody about it um you didn't i never said a word to anyone because i didn't think anyone would believe me oh, you know i figured yeah. everybody would think oh you're telling one of your stories again because i used to love to sit and make up stories for my friends 
and just tell them once upon a time and I would just roll with it. Whatever thoughts they would throw my way, I would add it into the story and just keep going. Um, do you write? I don't. I, I really should sit down and do it again. I've been trying to make myself journal on a regular basis and I don't. I guess because I just got so busy for so many years, I kind of lost that aspect. I used to write a lot. And um, uh, when I was in high school, I know I, I would write short stories for my English teacher when they would ask for short stories. And most everybody would turn in one or two pages and I'd give them 30, you know. Well, they said short. <laughs> That's right. They said a short story. So 30 pages is a short story in my world. Um, I've always been an avid reader. My mother was an avid reader. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's kind of congenital you know you need to see people reading to become a reader i think yeah and just growing up we didn't we didn't have a tv unless somebody found out we didn't have a tv and they'd give us an old one or something and so we'd have it until it quit working um but we never had cable or anything like that i mean it wasn't even really around until yeah that wasn't invented. high school i didn't it was high school when cable first came out for me and that was in the 70s yeah the late yeah. 70s but um Usually there were three channels, three stations. Yeah. And you have local versions, and so there were more than three, but there were really only yeah, three. Yeah, and a lot channels. of snow. Yeah. <laughs> First time I said something to somebody about, yeah, we used to sit and watch the snow. And they didn't know what you meant. And they did like, <laughs> like, really, yeah, you know, like amazing. I don't understand <laughs> what that means. It's it like you'd had to have been there. <laughs> but I said, you stare at it long enough, you start seeing shapes in the, in the snow. And just, you know, we, we would make up stories. What did we see in the snow? That kind of, I don't know. We were weird kids. We had nothing to do. <laughs> I was going to say, did you live in the country? Actually, no, we lived in the city. Um, I was a city girl during the week and a country girl on the weekend. When I was little, I would go with my grandfather to his parents' farm. And so on the weekends, it was milking the cows and getting the eggs and, you know, so good, yeah. my great grandmother make butter and 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 that kind of stuff on the you know with the big you turn. knew you knew your great grandmother yeah wow. my son knew my great grandmother oh wow she I, lived I, I, I was don't 98. Mean, i don't mean, mean to imply anything insulting but did you get guys get married when you were like 11 or something <laughs> how did you i was that? 22 when we got married had my son at 23 um what about your mother and your grandmother? Though? My mother was 18 when she had me. See, that's young. Yeah. My grandmother was 18 when she had her. Yeah. My great grandmother was 17 or 18. When she, I came from six generations of firstborn daughter to firstborn daughter. Oh, wow. And I broke it with a boy. <laughs> I was going to say, did you have a daughter? Isn't there something about if you're the seventh son of a seventh son? Son, something like that. Did you have the, the sight? Yeah. yeah and, uh, but I had a son. I did, my mom left. I also broke six generations of the firstborn being a breach. Really? It was a boy, and he wasn't a breach. And so my mom was like, well, when you break tradition, you do it all the way. And I, it's interesting that it was gender related too. Yeah, I don't know why Can that you is. Hear that? Sounded like a horn honking. Yeah, my next door neighbor is a firefighter and <laughs> he's been having trouble with his car. It's got this brand new truck and it's like a tank, you know, because he's oh, a God. firefighter. And I'm in the uh, south. We got those everywhere. <laughs> the alarm, the alarm keeps going off and all the flashing lights and that's pretty funny. What's bad? You get some of these guys, young guys in those big trucks, you know, and they're driving around. They'll set off the alarms on all the other cars. Well, if we're not complaining because this is a young couple that's moved in here and uh, they could not be better neighbors for two old folks. He's an EMT and she's an emergency room nurse. Oh, Perfect. God, you got a name. <laughs> We got the bases covered. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. <laughs> now if I could just get a vet to move in on the other side. You know, there you go. Step. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, when, when I was in high school, my grandparents had horses. And uh, the vet lived across the street. 
So he never had to take the horses into the vet's office for shots and to be checked and stuff. He would just walk across the street. That's really convenient, boy. Yeah, How that was that nice. was nice. Um, but uh, yeah, I just um, I started watching YouTube and yeah, and I kind of always knew I was sort of psychic. I'd been told that by other psychics through the years. They would just make an offhand comment to me about, you know, you're psychic. And I'd be like, yeah, right. And never thought past that. And um, then when I found this community and I finally started getting involved and talking to people and suddenly I had people saying, you know, you're psychic, right? I can see it on you. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 oh, yeah, okay. I don't know about that. but And then I had one lady was like, send me your mailing address. And I'm like, why? She says, because you need to read. You're a reader. And she mailed me two decks of cards. Oh, wow. And so my first two decks of cards came from another well, chatter. Well, it was meant to be then. I got <laughs> mine from uh, our good friends at Amazon. <laughs> there you go. Well, the, I think my next deck, I, the first deck I bought came from Amazon. So um, uh, My kids are very uh, socially con. I mean, it's very good. It's not a bad thing. But sometimes it, it backfires because they torture me about things. One of the things they torture me about is ever ordering anything from Amazon. But the problem is we live in the middle of nowhere. We're still quarantining. And so there's no place for us to shop. You know, you can shop directly <coughs> to other places. But frequently Amazon is cheaper because there's no post. I mean, I'm justifying yeah. it. and I No, you're not... It's I terrible. order from Amazon daily for work. <laughs> well, they have a monopoly on it, don't they? They do. I mean, yeah. and when it comes to parts and, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh, at uh, home, I order from Amazon because I'm in Southwest Louisiana, and you, you can find Christian bookstores that sell all kinds of stuff for the Christians, but there's not that many esoterical type places or mystical places yeah. and so you, you if you want cards or something you kind of have to go shop online well, um, at least you have some kind of book store in your area i, no I did i just discovered i just discovered that there is a little um like a little witchcraft type shop uh oh, not far from campus and um my uh my surrogate daughter i call her she and my son were best friends in high school and um She's always said, you're my other mama. So Aww. she's my surrogate baby. She's my baby girl that I never had. So. Yeah. Um, and she'd come by one day and she was like, why don't you go to that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like get in the car. Let's go. <laughs> and she took me over there because she practices Wicca. She's a Wiccan. Oh, that's and, so interesting. I love that. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. So I've always been intrigued with that. And I have a couple of friends that are pagan and then, I just found out that we have a fairly active spiritualist pagan Wiccan type group here in town that meet once a month at the public library in one of their rooms. That surprises me. That, and, uh, that really so they've, been, they've reached out to me and through something on Facebook, I had seen something they had posted that came across my feed. And I responded, you know, said, oh, how interesting. And next thing I know, I got an invite to go to a meeting. So Did the you last know? one they had, I missed. I, something came up at work and I couldn't get away early enough. So um, I'm open to make the next meeting. And then two, three days ago, I came home from work and there was, I don't know, teenage angst, stuff going on. They had to call the cops and, you know. And when you're oh, in, in your neighborhood? In my in our apartment complex, um, when you live somewhere that the majority of the tenants are college students, <laughs> you get a lot of that angst, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if she was somebody's mom or if she was just giving somebody a ride home, but she was there just kind of. And I got out of my car and I walked up and I said, "What's going on?" And <laughs> and she started telling me. We started talking and she was, you know, well, what do you do? And I told her, yeah, I work on campus and. And I said, but I'm also, you know, I said, I'm also a reader. I, I, I read Oracle and, and tarot cards on YouTube. 
she would that was it she was like oh, did you know they have a group here that does they meet in the That's, library yeah, she you're really lucky going to the last meeting i was like i know i couldn't make it for that meeting she says well you got to come to the next one i said i plan on it you're now, so lucky you know i tell people that i in my neighborhood will you know ask me what i've been doing and I'm even reluctant to tell them anymore because nobody has any interest whatsoever. whatsoever. They all think I, I'm crazy anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I originally started out, I would just say I'm a content creator on YouTube. And I would leave it at that. And then well, if they asked me yeah. further, well, what do you create? You know, and then I would then I would go into it. And if they looked interested, I would explain a little more. And if they didn't, I would just leave it at that and just you know, that's what I do. Okay. <laughs> no big well, deal. Well, I just, you know how I do books on Saturdays. And yes. a couple of weeks ago, I did this new book, uh, The New Science of Heaven, which is about plasma physics. It's really interesting. Sounds awful. It's not. It's not religious. I've listened to part, part of the first one, I think. Really interesting book. Yeah. I have a neighbor who's a retired college professor, and he walking our dogs he asked me you know what have you been doing and i told him oh i read this great book and i get all excited about the book and i'm telling him the theories in the book and he kind of scoffed and i said no wait a minute now these people are nobel prize winning astrophysicists these are not lunatics these are really well informed people yeah and he says oh astrophysicists they're all crazy anyway that's how people react around here nobody's in yeah well you get that down here you get that in the evil eye <laughs> <laughs> get away from me satan kind of thing you know? <laughs> and, uh, although they'll call a treater which is a cajun medicine woman or a medicine man one of the wow. other um but they're called a treater. They'll call them in a New York second if somebody gets sick or something weird happens. And most of the local sports teams have one on call 24 seven. No team. Yes. <laughs> how, do, how do you spell that? Do you, do you remember oh, a treater? Um, it's French, right? It's French. And I'm not really sure how I've oh, always, I bet, I, Treat I've always like just spelled treat, it phonetically, treat her, you know. You and, are somebody who yeah. treats people. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. So, oh, um, isn't that interesting? <laughs> but, uh, and I mean, I had heard about him growing up, but I didn't know, I didn't know any. And then when my son was little, he was in like second grade, second or third grade, uh, he suddenly got an earache one afternoon, temperature shot up. We're running around like crazy trying to pack up, you know, take him to the emergency room. And my next door neighbor, this little hillbilly woman, come knock on the door and wanted to borrow an egg or a cup of sugar or something. And like, yeah, yeah, sure. Come on in. And she's like, what's going on? And so my husband's telling her, you know, her son's sick. We're trying to get him to the ER. And she was like, can I pray over him? We're like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. <laughs> it couldn't hurt. Right. And she sat down with him and started rubbing her hands together and started speaking in a language I've never heard. She laid her hands on him and she just sat there rocking with him in her lap, rubbing his ear, speaking that language. And after about five minutes, she got up and she says, okay, thank you for the egg or whatever it was. And she left and he was bouncing off the walls. Perfectly fine. Not a thing wrong with him. So she was an energy healer. Yeah, big time, big time energy healer. And my husband and I are just looking at each other going, did we just see what we think we just saw? <laughs> well, you know, it's really interesting. I've been reading a lot of um, Dolores Cannon's books, and they're new to me. A lot of people know them really well. I've heard well, a lot about them, but I've not read any of them. So Yeah, well, I think the time was right. You know, the information presents itself when you're ready to accept it, you know. Very and, true. And, and I take what she says with a block of salt. I'm trying very hard not to be gullible either. But she talks about things that they now are starting to be able to prove with physics which yeah. metaphysics and physics are meeting in the middle. And one of those things is that we actually are surrounded by an energy field. 
and you know some people would call it an aura so in this book on plasma physics it talks about you have your body your solid body and then you have a body like a cloud of microbes all around you and then beyond that you have a magnetic electromagnetic field your your plasmoid body right and my husband has teased me for decades that i have a negative energy field around me because everything breaks on me you know everything breaks yeah i can't wear like i have to take this off as soon as we're done if i wear it for more than an hour or two it the chain will break it'll just fall off i've had my mother's pearls explode off my neck in a dark restaurant yeah yeah my so, late husband could not wear a watch it would spin backwards on him and die right, within same, minutes same here same i here. wound up having to buy him a pocket watch which my son now has put up in a like a shadow box yeah, with some yeah of his stuff, memory, you know yeah yeah but, um, this book was saying that we have this electromagnetic sort of plasmoid body around us and when when you get sick it's coming from the outside in and energy healing is a real thing but she also did a book about nostradamus and he in the 1500s said the same thing yeah he had this really high success rate of making people better he was a doctor but he would he treat people in private because he was doing like reiki and energy healing and he didn't want to be burned at the stake as a witch exactly so he, he kept it a secret but he in the, in her book Dolores Cannon's book he's talking through a, a hypno a no, hypnosis session and he says that you can cure things from the outside in by adjusting the energy it's usually a block in the energy of some sort now i don't know i don't do any of that i still take aspirin you know but uh i live you know, on pain I'll, medicine so yeah <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with it and i don't disbelieve it i think it's entirely possible now denise we were talking about denise siegel she reads auras and i told her when i first met her you're not allowed to look at me because I don't want you reading my aura because of that big black cloud that's over my head. I don't, <laughs> I don't want you to know. Oh, my goodness. But can, can you imagine? It must be um, disconcerting to know stuff about people by looking at them and you can see it around well, Wasn't it Edgar Casey who could see people's auras? And yes. There was a story that they told that he went to get on an elevator one day and when the, the doors opened and the people inside and none of them had an aura, they were all like blank. And he backed up and said, I'll take the next elevator. And the elevator, something happened. It dropped and they all died in the elevator. Oh, I didn't know that story. And I was like, I, I saw that on some documentary about him or something. It was one of the yeah, stories that. about him. And I was like, holy crap, man, that would freak me out. It would be really, I, I had a couple of experiences in my life where I've gotten bad vibes is the only thing I can talk about yeah. call it by a stranger in a crowd and I've had to abandon my groceries and leave the I, I couldn't be no yeah. no explanation except that it felt yucky you know but uh I can't imagine if you could look at people and you could see and, and that would be weird. we all have the capacity to do that we have to learn you know I I took a um I didn't take a class. I, I listened in on this class and this has been decades ago and I don't know what struck my interest in it other than it just sounded kind of cool. And it was uh, somebody talking about teaching yourself how to read horrors. Oh, and they great. And they said to start, start with a plant because all plants have an aura around them. Yeah. And if you can concentrate on it and look at it long enough, you'll start to see the energy around the plant. And so one day I went outside and thought, okay, I'm going to try this. And it worked. I could see it on the plant. Now I've never been able to do it on a person, but I was talking to somebody just this past week. And I can't remember now who it was. I was talking to who said, well, would, would sparkly things around people be considered an aura? Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Probably a positive thing. If you think about it. She oh, says, I sparkly things around people. She says, it's like, you know, some people like really sparkle. 
And other people, it's like just a really dull kind of spark. Like they don't sparkle. You just see like little light, but they don't sparkle. But she says a lot of people, they sparkle all around them. I was like, that's a damn, I've never heard of that one. But that's a gem. That's, that's, that's what you gym. see, baby. Then you go for it. You know, it's. Yeah. I think that's very cool. I would love, in on one level, would love to be able to do that. On another level, I think it would really present special issues because you would have information about people that they didn't know they were giving you. Yeah, that's and that can get weird. That you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's part of as a reader when you read. I mean, I do a lot of personal readings. Um, I do some political because I'm I'm interested in it, but I always preface it with. I don't know how much is my opinion <laughs> and how much is spirit because I'm pretty politically opinionated in what I think and believe. Um, I said, but I try to take myself out of it and just read the cards. Um, and, but with personal readings, it's different. I don't like to do a reading. If somebody asked me to read on their husband or their daughter, or it's like, yeah, it kind of wigs me out a little bit because that's reading somebody's energy that you don't have permission to read. So well, you don't want to. Also, people take take it to heart, and you don't yeah. want to misread, interfere yeah. in a relationship, or because you know it's all reading energy, and and energy depends on free will choices. Things exactly, change, you know. So there's a difference between doing that and being the kind of psychic who looks into a crystal ball and can tell the future. Some people yeah. can do both. And I, I, I've been thinking about getting a crystal ball just to see if it works. Well, let me, let me tell you something. They're expensive. I know. They're really expensive. I've had one on my Amazon wish list forever. It's like, come on, somebody, somebody be a good patron and buy that for me. I'm going to put it at the top of the list. One of my kids asked me what I wanted for Christmas a couple of years ago, and I told her, well, I'd love to get a crystal ball. Oh, okay. And then she got back to me and she thought, I don't know. Those yeah. things are expensive. Yeah, they're I expensive. It $25, you know? <laughs> so, oh, well. But I, I like to do political readings because you said you mentioned um, that your opinions can color. Yeah. And what I've discovered is that Oftentimes, I'll research something, and I'll rant and rave, and then I'll do a card reading on them. That's kind of how I run the right, yeah. channel, right? But and I'm usually right there with you on it yeah. too. Like, yeah, <laughs> you're ringing my bells. Every once, <laughs> every once in a while, a topic will come up at the last minute, and I just feel compelled, and I'll read cards like like a completely cold reading. I'll have absolutely no opinion no idea what's really going on and i'll read cards and inevitably people will get in touch with me and they'll say oh you said this this and this well you were right did you know and i well no <laughs> i had no idea it's shock shocking to me yeah i've but had I've that happen that when you have a strong opinion about something like reading politics oftentimes I feel like your opinion is almost you're being guided, you know? You that could see, and that, that's kind of how I look at it, that I must feel that way because that's the way that's right. Yeah. spirit wants me to feel. Yeah. You know, or that's yeah. the truth being presented to me, and that's what I'm picking up right. on. Um, I'll, I'll tell you but at story. the same time, you know, I want people to be aware of the fact that I'm very politically opinionated, opinionated. <laughs> and I will give you my opinion if you ask. Yeah. If you don't ask, I will keep it to myself just because I don't want to get into arguments with people. Oh, right. right. I well, that's why I so, you know. Nobody wanted to hear. So I figured yeah. I'll, talk, I'll talk to myself. Yeah. <laughs> why not? But um, what was I going to tell you? I was going to tell you a little story. Oh, being guided. I, I, I know I've said this a million times, but I haven't told you, So, you, and you're a captive audience. <laughs> when I was very young, when I was learning how to read, I was a weird little kid, and I, I didn't read children's books. I started just reading books. I, I didn't start reading like at three years old. I was seven-ish, and that's, that's old to learn, but I went immediately to grown-up books. And 
that was what was around the house. And I found uh, the story of the Trapp family singers, Maria von Trapp, you know, the sound of music, that family. That's a true story. Yep. Sort of true. Yeah. Well, and they embellished a lot for the movie, but the book right. was, was, was different. <laughs> it was Based more, more right realistic. Yeah. yeah. So I'm reading this book and it's talking about the father was a baron, you know, he was Austrian nobility and he was really upset. The children couldn't understand what was really going on. I, as a seven year old, six or seven, didn't understand what he was talking about, but he was not happy about the Nazis taking over Austria. And then the day they had the big parade to welcome them, all the neighbors were flying the Nazi flag and he refused to do it. And he got himself on the wrong foot with the Nazi authorities, the Gestapo, right away. And they really did have to flee. After yeah. they were gonna comp and they really did flee like that. It was very brave of them. But I didn't know what a Nazi was. I thought a Nazi was like a monster. But the word itself. Yeah, in a way they kind of were. <laughs> yeah. But the description and the word, the description of their attitude and behavior and the word itself created a kind of a visceral reaction in my gut. And I knew they were coming back. I, I just knew. I didn't say, oh, guess what? The Nazis are coming back. <laughs> Go by your seven. It's past your bedtime. No, I. but I knew they were coming back. And it grew and it grew this sort of um, dread, this gnawing dread. And uh, I firmly believe that we are all here right now. Everyone's just going, oh, my God, you know, I, I feel so helpless. What can I do? Well, we've got to fight back. Putting out that good energy and, yeah. and the, the, knowing, acknowledging that it's bad and being the opposite of the bad. That's what that's what you can yeah. do, you know. Nothing well, that's because we're all light workers. We're that's that's part of our mission. I firmly believe why we're all here is is to fight back the bad, the evil, the terrible, the whatever title or name. Yeah, I don't think you know. I don't think there's any big dramatic uh, job. It, I mean, I I'm not connected to the government. The UN doesn't want to hear from me. You know? <laughs> me either. You know, so I'm I'm just just an admin. I sit in an office and. Type in the spreadsheets all day. Well, I think so, it boils down to things like um, being, even if it's fake, being friendly to your neighbor who's a big old Nazi. Because <laughs> that's kind of the situation we're in right now. I live in the South. <laughs> I don't want to make eye contact. I certainly don't want to smile and say hello. But it's, you know, that's. The kind of energy that has to get put out there and that's really hard to do i have a, a nephew from my husband's side of the family um who's we're about the same age actually i, I became an aunt the day i got married because my husband was the baby out of seven yeah so the older kids already had kids and a couple of them were having kids and because you know he was in his late 20s when we met and i was in my early 20s so there was a little bit of that a generational there. thing, yeah. Yeah, um, and I know we would get into it online, some on Facebook, my nephew and I, because he's very right wing. And oh. one day he he said something and made it like more of a personal, and I had to stop him in his tracks. I said, "Whoa, stop!" So we can argue till the cows come home. Difference of opinions, politically, socially, whatever. I said, but we don't, we don't make it personal. I said, you know, if it gets to that point where you're that frustrated, that's when you take a back step and say, we just have to agree to disagree and drop it and leave it at that. And I didn't hear anything for a couple of days. And then he, he messaged me back. He said, you know, you're right. And I was out of the line. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have made it personal. Well, good for him. That took courage for him to say that, you know, this it, has it, divided so many. I lost <laughs> my five closest friends. Yeah. As because of this crazy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's real it's shocking. It's weird because it's like in our family, I guess because of the generation that I came along, all of all of the aunts and uncles I grew up with were actually my great aunts and great uncles. They were 
they were all my grandmother's brothers and sisters and stuff. And um, so uh, it's weird now because it's like all but one sis one sister now I believe is still alive, and she's gone upstairs now dementia alzheimer's something i don't know would um, that be your mother's sister uh it was my mother's aunt my grandmother's sister. Aunt. Oh, okay my grandmother's sister yeah. yeah and um so i mean i have a few cousins that are scattered around uh, a couple here still in louisiana that again very right wing but you know it's like look i'm a liberal you're a conservative okay fine Let's just leave it at that. And we just won't talk politics and just leave it alone. And so were they, I'm interested if you were raised with strong political opinions from your parents or. Um, well, it was just my grandparents. I know my grandmother was a Democrat simply because I remember when JFK was killed and then when Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and all them were killed, I was little, but I remember it. And I remember how upset she and my mom were. Uh, my grandmother had a housekeeper that came in like three days a week, uh, a black woman who growing up, I just thought she was another member of the family. I had no clue she was hired help. You know, I just, she was just family. She was there. Um, but I can remember when each, as each one of them died, I can remember the three of them sitting and crying together because of what's going on, you know. Uh, so, I mean, uh, my uh, my great-grandmother was in love with JFK. Oh, my God, he could do no wrong as far as she was concerned. Um, so, and my mom was, like I said, a single parent with two kids in the 60s and 70s, and she was involved in the ERA and now and all of that. So there was a lot of marches I went to as a kid a lot of pamphlets I stuffed in baggies to, <laughs> to pass. Was she out. did she like she had did she have she had brothers and sisters? So she had a sister. Okay, I, I'm just I guess I'm trying to be nosy. I'm trying to figure out why the divide in your family now. Um, you know, I really don't know. I think it's just um, I think a lot of it just had to do with age differences and locations where most of the family was kind of off in one area and we went the other way <laughs> um there was there's one whole side of the family that my mother would never let us even associate with um simply really? because of how bigoted and racist they were she would have nothing to do with them and were they in louisiana too mm -hmm. they Isn't sure they still are i'm sure but i wouldn't know where to find any of them um, wow. Um, but of course, three fourths of the state has that same last name, so both colors. So it, you know, there's no telling if somebody's related to me or not. Oh, but I hear right. that name, you know. Um, but just she just refused to let us be around them, and uh, she was very, very much liberated for a single woman with two kids in the 60s and the 70s in the south in the south you know yeah. where you know she couldn't have a bank account unless a man signed off on it yeah she couldn't I buy a house unless now, when she bought that. a house my grandfather had to go and sign papers with her for her to buy a house you know that kind of thing um and uh she just was kind of she and her sister both were kind of the black sheep of the family i guess yeah because yeah. they were both very liberal, very liberated, very pro civil rights, pro equal rights, pro women's rights, and um, the rest of the family thought they were nuts. So, well, and I have a kind of the opposite. I come from a big family, and I, you know, without talking too much, you know, without their permission, and they can't give me their permission because. Most of them are not speaking to me anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> we were raised very Irish, Catholic, liberal, Democrat, Union type people, right? Yeah. Very pro 
civil rights. Now, the only thing that didn't fit into that was the Equal Rights Amendment because they're gigantic misogynists. But, um, you, know, yeah. women, you know, women should be at home pregnant. My father once told me, what do you want to go to college for? You're just going to get married and have children. <laughs> That's not, oh, God. So anyway, uh, interestingly enough, we've kind of done the flip of what your mother did. Uh, I have conflicted relationships with people in the family who have gone extremely right wing. And yeah. it's shocking to me the way we were all raised the same, uh, yeah. those attitudes, you know. And I find it utterly shocking, and I'm not entirely sure what led to that split, to that divide. So I don't know this consumption of media. Yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, I really... I can't recall really knowing anybody that had such strong political views until Fox News came along. And when suddenly you had that network pumping out what they were pumping out every day, and I didn't even realize, because I used to watch it too, and I'd watch it and I'd listen, and I'd think, what is wrong with these people? Why are they talking like that? That's that's not how it works. And yeah. I just didn't get it because I wasn't brainwashing. I wasn't politically active. It is. It is very much brainwashing. Um, and I'm sure the other side thinks that the other networks are that way for the left. You know, <laughs> oh, you're just being brainwashed. I'm like, no, I just read the facts. That's that's a well, I, I don't watch. But I know, like with my mom, never watch. even finished high school. You know, yeah. And she always said her greatest accomplishment was both her kids got a college education. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, but, you know, she was very, very warm, very loving, didn't know a stranger. You couldn't be a stranger five minutes around her. She would know your whole life story, have you in number in the phone and <laughs> the whole bit. I mean, she just, that's just, just her personality. It sounds like she had a lot of compassion, but it sounds like the, some of the other part of your family got mind control by yeah have you have you a seen, lot of it was religious related you know yeah, um, don't get me started have you yeah. seen um the documentary the brainwashing of my dad i saw that yes that's that came out a while back or maybe it was the book i read i don't remember what i covered the book here okay and the author jen senko i she has come and talked on on my channel a couple of oh times. wow i missed that i have to look we, back we have a lot in common <laughs> it's really interesting she's yeah it's, it's all back there someplace she's um she lives in new york she makes documentaries she made the book after the documentary because there was so much interest in the documentary but uh long story short they deprogrammed her father because uh just so happened that at the height of his complete brainwashing, they moved. And when they moved, she and her mother conspired to pretend <clears throat> there was something wrong with the TV and the internet. And they blocked all the conservative channels and they didn't, and they blocked all of his favorite right wing uh, websites that he was donating money to. They blocked all of them. And at first he was like, I just don't understand why I can't get this to work. But very, not that long, but gradually he, he was deprogrammed and became back to his normal self. Yeah. So it really is exposure that's reinforced and reinforced. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, uh, you know, and, and I think the thing that really gets to be the most, and I know I see it down here a lot, um, you see people that are very vocal, very um, in your face for the right, you know, and for the evangelical bent and the 45 bent and just the whole shebang. But let you speak up and say, no, I don't agree with that or no, I, I, you know, I believe blah, blah, blah. And you would think somebody had dropped the bomb. I mean, they, they will explode all over you, you know, like you're this horrible creature. It was like, I'm the same person you were talking to five minutes ago. It just, now, you know, I'm not brainwashed like you are, but well, you know, under all that anger, it's, it's fear. It's defensiveness yeah. because it's fear and, and they are manipulated by fear. It's, it's repeated on, on uh, all those news stations. It's re 
repeated from the pulpit on Sunday, and they are just wrapped. And depending on your local newspapers, if they if you even have a local newspaper anymore, yeah. or if it's a conglomerate, it's been bought out by somebody. I mean, we don't even have local radio stations hardly anymore, or very few. Most of them have been bought out by, you know, the big corporate uh, license holders for that kind of thing. And so it's like North Korea. <laughs> very much so. Um, I mean, it's hard. You flip around on the radio here. I mean, you can get good stations, plays, plays great music, but everybody repeats the same stuff, you know, and in all of the advertisements or the rhetoric or talking about this, that, or the other. And it's like, okay, you're just talking about this song by Crosby, Still Nash and Young, who were big time proponents of civil and equal rights. <laughs> and yeah, that's our track, track, isn't it? you know, you're going to talk the exact opposite before or after their song and make no connection. It's mind blowing. That is, well, you know, I do a lot of research um, uh, in, on the internet for newspaper articles, and I really notice that they all say the exact same thing. They're all using the exact same story. I mean, the wording is exactly, they're just copying each other. There's yeah. Maybe one or two original um, takes on, on a topic and everybody else has the stockpile of information and they all take the same thing. So the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Huffington, all of them. The Atlantic, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a great uh, independent newspaper in Texas of all places. I can't remember if it's Houston or Austin. I can't remember. And, and Where are the two? Austin is the capital. Yeah. And they tend to be very, um, very, very progressive there. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird because it's the capital, you know. And, you have all Republican state legislators and stuff there. And then Houston is, that's a big toss up there because you've got a lot of different people groups all mixed in together in Houston. You get a lot of people that are be very conservative just because they're very Catholic, you know, or they're very evangelical and that's what they're told from the pulpit, you know, um, it's the same. I mean, Louisiana, where I'm at, is uh, basically a Catholic state. I mean, we don't yeah. even have parishes. We have parishes because that's how it was split right, up. Right, right. Was, yeah, the Cajun French. So, and the original settlers came down from Nova Scotia, which when they got thrown out of France, they went to Nova Scotia. They got thrown out of Nova Scotia. They came down the Mississippi and landed here. And uh, but their you know, Catholicism is very big here. Yeah, um, it's still probably seventy percent of the people in Louisiana are Catholic. Really, yeah. that high? And um, oh yeah, I mean, I even though we've that. got a pretty big evangelical showing, Catholics are still far outweigh any other. Um, one of the things I like about the area I'm in, we have a large uh, uh, Indian, uh, like from India, uh, Indian group of peoples that live here. And so there are a lot of Hindus that live here now. And so we have an annual holy festival every year in the yeah. park, uh, which is Isn't fantastic. Isn't that the one where they throw, throw all the colors? colors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So everybody's the same. And, um, which is funny coming from a system that's based on the caste system, but you know, <laughs> I guess you take it as you can get it. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, they have the belly dancers that are there and um, you can take classes in it and stuff, you know, I mean, uh, no, you can take, <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> My body hadn't moved like that in a long time. <laughs> I would not subject anybody else to watching me belly dance. I don't and there's some of them that dance that they're my size or larger. You know, you would think you're going to put that on and jiggle. Well, that's, it, it's more about the ability to move. And I can't walk across the 
floor on a flat surface without hurting. I have to use a cane <laughs> everywhere I go now. So yeah. Oh, do um, you? Oh no. I, I have. A, I have. A, I got injured back in '99, and I have a. De I have degenerative disc disease. Oh. And we awful. just discovered that um, I have two discs now, all the way at the bottom of my spine, uh, from the lumbar going into the. Uh, scapulus uh the l4 l5 and the s1 s2 i think it is i've got discs that are no longer there it's yeah. just oh. on bone now so i'm actually seeing, i'm actually seeing a orthopedic surgeon tomorrow to have him take a look at my newest x-rays because my pain management doctor was like you know it's been a while since we've taken any x-rays let's have a look see you know, a couple of weeks ago, and he came yeah. back, and he's like, okay, you have no disc left at all here and here. And I was like, no wonder my back hurts. He's like, he come in, and because my doctor's the same age I am, right? He comes in, he's like, girlfriend, he says, don't let anybody tell you you don't feel pain. <laughs> he says, I honestly don't know how you get up and move, move every day. And I said, there are some days I can't. I mean... There are some days I literally have to crawl to the bathroom. I cannot stand up. It just people don't appreciate the challenges of getting older. I mean, it's it's yeah. one thing after another, and the old need to be respected. No, not that you're old. <laughs> I'll be sixty-two in June, so a lot of people tell me you're still young. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be. How old am I? <laughs> this is an odd year, right? Yeah, we're twenty-three. Odd age. I'll be 69 this year. Okay. Well, you're just a couple of years ahead of me. You know, just a few years. It's, <laughs> it takes its toll. But but I still think like I'm 20. That's the kicker. I still think like I'm 20. I mean, the rest of me just laughs and laughs. But a lot of me still thinks like, oh, I can do that. And then it's like, no, you can't. <laughs> but you, would you go back? If you could go Only back. if I knew what I know now. Want to? I wouldn't want to go back to all the headaches. Not to I twenty. Do. I would maybe forty. I, I forty wanna, wouldn't be bad. I want a house full of little kids. I wouldn't want to go back to that either. You know, by forty, my son was in the navy, so he was grown by then. He, he joined the navy when he was about twenty, twenty-one, I think, something like that. After his dad passed, and uh, it was like somebody had to teach him how to be a man, so. He just up and decided, he came and picked me up at work one day. He said, oh, by the way, I joined the Navy. And I said, wow. you're thinking about joining the Navy? He said, no, I joined today. And I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> you did what? <laughs> He's like, yeah. How shocked were you? I was very shocked and I was very nervous um, because I just didn't know. He's, a, he's very artistic. He draws, he does music, he paints, he does... He's never been a sports person or not Mr. Macho. Not Mr. Guy. He's, he's yeah. a little guy. He's like five feet one, maybe. I'm five foot. His dad was five four. <laughs> so I was like, you stood no chance. You were always gonna be short. Um, so he's just a little guy, you know. And uh he just up and joined and um and he always said it was the best decision he ever made because it taught him how to grow up, you know. I mean after two deployments, now he fights PTSD that we deal with, but yeah. uh, it's slowly getting better. It just takes time. And uh, but, but you wouldn't know. want to go back to when when he was a teenager. You wouldn't. I mean, those, those oh, headaches, no. Those, those, <laughs> those, I mean, I, we fought like cats and dogs when he was a teenager, just like my mom and I did. When I, I was a teenager, it. my mother and I constantly butted heads. Yeah, I'm enjoying being the age I am. I'm I'm glad that I've lived long enough. I wouldn't mind enough. being 20 or 30 again, just physically. It's to be that flexible in movement again and not hurt all the time. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I can understand that. But yeah. as far as the rest of it, no, I'm perfectly fine where I'm at. I mean, but like I said, I still think like I'm 20. I still... I love hanging out with the college kids. <clears throat> I mean, I don't teach, but they know they can come hang in my office anytime they just want to chit chat. You know, I get students all the time that come just hang out in the, 
you busy, Miss Sherry? Can I come hang with you for a little while? I'm That's like, yeah. so cool, though, because it keeps you exposed to new ideas and fresh yeah. attitudes. And We have a program yeah. that they started up on campus called Project Allies, um, and it's to train people to provide a safe space for LGBTQ students. And the minute I heard You're about it, I went to my boss and I said, yeah. we have to do this. We have to be one of those spaces. And he said, go, go do the training, go do your thing, you know. Good for you. And I was like, because, you know, we're, I'm in computer science. The majority of our students are foreign, you know, oh. uh, especially in the graduate level, because uh, we have from undergraduate all the way up to PhD in, in, in the computer sciences, all the different variations of it. Um, and a lot of our students are foreign students. You know, I'm like, for them to come out of the closet is where they're from. Could Culturally, be a yeah, yeah. You know, being yeah. From being cut off because most of them come from wealthy families. That's how they can afford to come to America to go to school anyway. Because mama and daddy got money, you know. But they have to do and learn and study what mama and daddy tell them to do and learn and study, you know. Um, when I first started working there, I had a student that came in, really sweet young lady, and she hated computer science. And she was struggling really hard in it. And she came in one day to talk to the professor who was in a meeting, he wasn't gonna be back for a couple of hours. And she wanted to know if she could just sit in the office with me. And I said, yeah, sure, go right ahead. And she just started talking and she started, I mean, in tears, she started crying, you know, and I said, well, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to be a fashion designer. I want to design clothes and, and you know, bring the East and the West fashion wise together so that both cultures can mix. And she had all these beautiful ideas. And I was like, well, what, why don't you just study that, change your major? Oh no, she said, my father would, my father would make me come home. Um, it, it's already, I'm here on extension to finish my degree. So before I go back and get married to whoever they say I'm going to get married to. I was like, of course, immediately the liberal in me is like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> you're in America. You can study whatever the hell you want to study. And then I had to stop myself and go, Oh, wait, this is a different culture with very different rules about what the girls can and cannot do. And I said, well, did you ask your dad if you could change your major? Oh, no, he wouldn't listen to me. And I said, well, how do you know until you ask him? I said, maybe if you approach him with, I really don't like what I'm studying, but here's what I would like to do. And then show him some of your ideas. I said, maybe he'll be willing to compromise with you. She said, I'll think about it. About six, five or six months later, she came back to my office one day. She came through and, and I hadn't seen her in a while. I was getting kind of worried, thinking, well, maybe she got yanked back home. Yeah, yeah. And she was just ecstatic because she went to her dad and she told him how much she hated what she was studying and this is what I really want to study and just went into the whole spiel of what she wanted to do and how she wanted to do it. And he compromised with her and he said, well, you can study that as a minor if you complete your degree in this. And then that way you'll have both. And then once you're done with that, you can decide what you're going to do. And she just she had to come by to come tell me. If you hadn't have told me to ask him, I never would have asked him. Oh, that's and, so good. And that made me feel so good because, yeah. you know, I had to, I was biting my tongue the whole time saying, you can't launch into your liberation speech because this young lady comes from a far different culture than that's what so I would, you know. Oh, I would not thrive. <laughs> in a situation like uh, oh my god terrible me either and then I had another young lady that just came back uh, from the Christmas holidays to come find me that she had brought me 
um, uh, uh, it's it's set inside like a it's like a carving put inside a basket of Durga, which is a Hindu goddess that um, is the strongest goddess of all the gods and goddesses. All the gods and goddesses made her to defeat evil. And so she's known as the protector of women and the protector of children and all that kind of stuff. And this student had gone home to see family for the holidays. And when she came back, she brought this little Durga with her to give me. She says, because you remind me of her so much. You're always helping everybody, you know. <laughs> I was like, I was really touched. Yeah. I didn't know Durga was. She's the figure in the Hindu religion has all the arms. Oh, I've got one right over here. Right yeah. Here. Yeah. Right over there. Yeah. There. And each I don't arm. Know what I have. I just have them. <laughs> yeah. She's, um, she was created by all of the other Hindu gods to defeat an evil God that they couldn't beat. And so they oh. created her and each arm represents a different God and their strength. Oh, isn't so that, that interesting? she can do in battle anything, anywhere, at any time, from any direction. Interesting. I didn't. Know and that. I was like, when she gave me that, I didn't know. I've seen the statue my whole life, but I didn't know who she was. What it what was, she yeah. Yeah, and when uh, Allie from Heart and Soul Collect uh, connected, has been doing a series on Ascended Masters, and she's just been inviting people to come in 20, 30 minutes talk about an ascended master that you connect with. And she had asked me about it right about the time that this student gave me the Durga. And I said, I would love to do it on this goddess, this Hindu goddess. I don't know anything about her. I'm going to have to read up on it. But it really touched me that this student saw me as a representation of this goddess for her, which floored me when I started reading and learning who this goddess was and what she did. I was just blown it's really away. Flattering. By it. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. I was like, wow. I mean, and you don't realize because you, you joke and you hang out with the kids and you joke and cut up and you don't really think about what you're saying or doing and how it might affect them. The impact that you have on them. Yeah. yeah. Or that they have on me. I mean, there have been a lot of them that have come through that have said something or done something that made me step back a minute and go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe that would work better if I did it that way instead of this way. And, you well, know? it sounds like you're open-minded, though. You have to be not too entrenched in your own way of thinking to be open yeah. enough to, to recognize when something like that happens. Well, and I, I I do try to pride myself on being open. I try to be as open-minded as I can. I will admit there are some little things I can be pretty stuck in the mud about, but um, just, you know, just part of its upbringing, I think. But my mother was very liberal, so very liberal-minded, and that's what she taught us to be. So, um, but anyway, uh, I feel like I've done more talking than <laughs> <laughs> well, my, I feel like my uh, favorite quotation is judge not lest you be judged. I'm going straight to hell for judging constantly. It is my, uh, I just, I can't help it. I work on that all the time. Try to think of the other person's point of view. Try to have compassion. Yeah. And I'll tell you what. It's, it's a battle. Easy. Yeah, yeah. And Especially when, when have, I see them doing really stupid things. <laughs> it's like, yeah, when you have a strong point of view about something, it's really difficult to look at it from the other person's point of view. Yeah. I think one of the best classes I took in uh, college was an English class, and we would have to do these pro and con uh, essays. But it was always we had to present both sides. It was, like just a debate, like, a debate. it was almost like a debate class, yeah, but it was yeah. a literature class, uh, just a regular English class. But every week we would get an assignment. You would like pick from three or four things that they would, that the professor would put up on the board. And then when you came back, you had to bring back in an essay and you had to present both sides of the argument. 
that's such a good mental exercise. Yeah, it is. Good. It yeah. helps me solidify some of my own beliefs. Yeah, because you're 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 yeah. working everything out, every aspect of the debate <clears throat> out, and looking at every single possible permutation of of how it can be looked at, and yeah. uh, it helps you to sort out the tangle in your head. Exactly. Because it's a rat's nest in here. <laughs> Well, I know when lockdown hit, I think my hair was maybe an inch longer than yours is right now. <laughs> well, you know, I had really long hair. I had really long red hair. And, uh, of course, it was starting to get gray. But when that happened, that unfortunate medical event happened, I was sick of listening to people complaining that they couldn't get their roots dyed. Because lockdown, yeah. right? I said, oh, you that point I had lost that battle. Roots, and I took the dog grooming thing to my head and I shaved my head off. And I thought, well, who cares? We're inside. We're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. No one's going to see it. It'll grow back. And I won't have any split ends. So it'll be a good thing. And lo and behold, I loved it. I couldn't believe how much easier it makes life. I saved so much money on shampoo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you know how much time women spend? screwing around Just with their hair. hair. It's oh, yeah. insane. And I wasn't even the farthest thing from fashion, you know, person. And I didn't do that. Uh, and I was shocked at how much easier it was. I thought, you know, men have been keeping this dirty little secret for a very long time. And women need to wise up. That hair thing, it's just another way to keep you occupied so you don't do important things. Yep. When I was in my mid forties, I lost the battle of the gray. It wouldn't color anymore. Oh, it's pretty. It's really and, pretty. And uh, I would go and they would put the color in and when they do the rinse out, the gray stayed gray. Come back out. <laughs> and it, it's just, um, and so it got really, really, really white. And then when I hit 60, it started turning blonde on me. And I've been a dark brunette my whole life. And I was like, okay, when I was a teenager, I would have killed to have had blonde hair. Who knew I had to wait till I was 60 for it to start turning blonde? Well, you know, you're very fashionable but, because uh, young women are getting their hair dyed gray. It's yeah, like I know. And I went to the, I go to the school, The there's a hair salon school here, uh, just about a mile and a half from my house. And that's where I go get my hair cut. And uh, so when I first, the first time I saw young women coming in and leaving with gray hair, and I'm like, okay, am, am I having like a, an embolism or something, <laughs> brain disconnect. And they were laughing, saying, No, that's the new style. Everybody's yeah. trying to get their hair your color. <laughs> and I'm like, You know, I spent all those years and all that money trying to keep it brown. Hang around long enough, you're going to come into style. It's like a broken clock's right twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I had somebody just the other day say, I found a pair of pants. They were so cool. They sat right on my hips, and then the bottoms like flared way out. And I said, oh, a pair of hip huggers. You have some? And I said, well, I did in the 60s when they were popular. <laughs> I said, I, I figured they'd come around eventually. They'd come back around again. But <laughs> Well, one of the nice things about uh, lockdown was it didn't matter what you wore. Because like you were saying, you could stay at home and, and not. Oh, I stayed in my caftans and my moo's most of the time. Yeah, uh, I've decided that my, you know how famous people like Steve Jobs, they have kind of like a uniform and they wear the same thing all the time. He always wore that stupid black turtleneck thing. Yeah. Right so I've decided that I have a uniform and it's uh, black leggings and one of those, uh, oh, what would you call it? Like a strap, a strap sleeveless over like t-shirt but it's not a t-shirt what's it called uh like a tunic almost no it's form more form fitting uh okay. than a tunic but it's it's not a camisole but it's not and it's not like a man i know what you're talking about i just don't know what, you know what i'm it. talking about i just like if you, you can get them on sale for four dollars at old navy so yeah. i can completely dress head to toe for under ten dollars <laughs> i just you know uh, i found uh, I, I discovered uh, Alfred Dunner's slacks. You can get them through JC Penney's. Um, and they're just elastic waistband pull-on slacks. 
but they're the most comfortable damn pants I've ever I've ever bought. And being only five feet tall, my hardest thing has always been to find even the short pants. Oh yeah, don't you get sick of hemming clothes? I yeah, just, I mean, oh, I hate it. Uh, exactly. And these, their short pants are actually short enough that I don't have to hem them. So. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah, so whenever yeah. I find them on sale, I go buy a couple more pair. And uh, so it's that's great to, very liberating to not be constrained by style and fashion. And I wear t shirts, long sleeve, short sleeve, sleeveless, whatever. I mean, working on campus, we have a very, a very loose dress code, I guess, you know, it's whatever's comfortable. That's um, great. At least in our department, anyway. I mean, nobody. As long as you look presentable, they don't care what you wear. And uh, so I just, yeah, I usually just have on a T-shirt or something from Walmart. You know, you get cute little T-shirts at Walmart and Target for nothing. And, uh, and my slacks and everything's big and loose and comfy on me because I can't stand tight clothes anyway. So <laughs> and I, laugh. I keep saying at the rate I'm going, I'm going to be as wide as I am tall before you know it. Y'all well, just roll me down the hall. I still try to figure out those dresses that are really popular. And I don't know, I don't know the terminology. I'm sure this is a term for them, but they're very tight. They look like ace wraps. They're so tight. Oh yeah. They're yeah. Very short. And often they're like, you know, they're topless, not topless, but they stop. But almost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so like when you take a deep breath, you're going to pop out of both ends. They look, like you get blood clots, they're so tight, you know, they yeah. just really look uncomfortable. And it's not an issue of what shape you are, although it can be, but <laughs> but it's more that they just look constraining and very uncomfortable. You constantly tugging at them so you, you know what's not hanging out, and, you know, it, just pulling the top up and the bottom down. And I don't understand. Like I said, it. take a deep breath. You're going to pop out of both ends, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the sides would split. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's, I've never, I think I was able to wear a halter top until I was like 12. And then <laughs> everything started blooming and it was like, oh, I can't wear that no more. So um, June was busting out all over. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and been busting out of the, and my biggest problem is I like button down shirts, but I can't wear them. Because if they fit here, yeah. you know, then the sleeves are down yeah, to there. Yeah. And if I get them to fit the arms, then they don't even go across the front. You know? Well, there's two important things to remember about women's clothes. Women's clothes are absolutely political. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> One is the economics of it. The reason why styles change is to force you to spend money. Because people are stupid and they think they need to look like everybody else. And I've been wearing the same pants and shirts for 10 years. <laughs> and then the, the second political thing about women's clothes is the less comfortable, the less practical, so that you're so, you can't run, you can't walk, you can't sit, you don't have pockets. That's all nonsense. It's. I hope that young women are going to come around and understand that they're being controlled by the fashion industry. Exactly. Exactly. I. It's. Yeah. It's. I have people all the time say, "Well, you know, if your if your top was a little bit more, maybe if it was a little bit more, you know, pulled in and not so big and loose." I'm like, "Uh, uh I don't like anything that's tight or constrictive on me." I'm. I went through all of that mess when I was in high school trying to fit in with the style. Yeah, yeah you do feel and, yeah, I went through certain I went through several years where you couldn't have caught me in anything shorter than a five inch stiletto shoe because really? I was convinced being five feet tall was a demeaning thing. <laughs> I wanted to be tall. And um could you walk in there? I could. I eventually I could run in them too if I had to, but I couldn't anymore. I haven't I been never, able to wear high heel shoes in never. years. Never been able to wear a heel. Never. No, I, I wear sneakers or sandals or sneakers or <laughs> I have a pair of I have two pair of motorcycle boots, flat flat uh, motorcycle boots, a black pair and a brown pair. So they whatever I'm wearing they'll match. 
And, uh, well, I'll tell you something that seems absolutely incomprehensible today. Well, I was kind of a hippie, and there was a whole <laughs> entire school year when I went to college that I never wore shoes. <laughs> I just went to school in my bare feet. I lived in my bare I It's hard to believe nowadays, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I can remember being barefoot most of the time. Yeah. When I was a little girl, I mean, we didn't wear shoes. And um, then we found out I was allergic to tetanus shots after I stepped on a rusty roofing tack. And oh, <laughs> so I don't go barefoot anymore. But um, I miss that. I, just, I love to go walk around in the grass um, barefoot. Now, in an apartment complex, that's kind of risky because they allow dogs here. So we have a lot of people walking dogs everywhere. They're supposed to scoop the poop, but they don't always do it. So, um, and nothing's more irritating than to step out in the morning on your way to work and your foot slides because somebody didn't ew. scoop the poop. Ew, oh, ew, ew, that's ew, when ew. I can make a sailor, a ship full of sailors blush. Yeah, that's <laughs> gross. Huh? That's, well, that's justified. That's it. Yeah, I, I try. I try not to curse. I mean, I do some. I don't know. It's just me, but. Um, yeah, if I get hit, if I get heated up, <laughs> anything goes <laughs> and it takes a lot to get me there. I don't get angry very easily because I lose control when I get angry. I lose control nice. of myself. I mean, it's like a volcano erupting. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I fight it. It's like, I just, I, you know, it, I have bitten my tongue to where blood comes out holding my temper in, you know, and to just leave the room or something until I can get away. But, um, and I'm an, I'm an epic slammer. If I get real irritated, I slam the cabinet doors and slam the pots and pans around, especially in the kitchen. I'll get in the kitchen. I'll start slamming everything. That's when the rest of the house knows, Oh, okay. Sherry's pissed. Well, <laughs> what did we do? And who did it? I learned to swear at the knee of an expert, my grandmother. <laughs> she had it down to an art form and I tried very hard not to do it on my channel only because I just don't want to upset people too much <laughs> right. sure. and YouTube will ding you for it too oh, do they? I mean, they can they can demonetize you oh I don't get it, any money anyway I don't care so I mean I'm I'm hooked up to be monetized, but I've not made any money from YouTube. So, it's, you know. I, I, one day I tried to figure out how to do it, and it involved having to use the computer, and I just gave up. I just <laughs> I can't, I can't be bothered. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of steps. To, I mean, I it took me about a week to set it all up because I kept having to go back and reread it, and I had to like open the other computer to put up the instruction page. So I could work on the my regular computer <laughs> to do what I needed to do. Yeah. I kept losing track of where I was and what I needed to yeah. do. That. Just getting my my channel figured out at the very beginning. Um, I have five girls, and I went through all five of them about two hours a piece over about a three day period, and each <laughs> conversation ended with them being mad at me and me crying. And then I go on to the next one. And eventually, after that much, you know, agita, I finally got it set up. But it was a nightmare. And um, yeah. actually, well, I, I some of the computer terrible. stuff is fairly easy, I guess, because my son, you know, started in the late 90s. I mean, when he had his teen years, we got our first computer back then. Um, and so I, we would sit down with him and he would kind of walk through, talk through what he was doing. And, uh, and then um, when I taught myself how to be an administrative assistant, I was in love with Clippy, the little, the little paper clip that would talk to you in Microsoft. You know, that if you had a question, Clippy would show up and tell you how to do it. No, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> How I learned to do spreadsheets. And, and Listen, all. I'm glad you're sitting down. <laughs> I haven't driven my car in three years. Oh, wow. <laughs> I walk everywhere. My husband takes the car.
and I need a car. So, you know, <laughs> I just walk everywhere. I just can't be bothered. I'm not a machinery person. He, t he takes the car out. He says, I'm going to take your car. I'm going to the post office. I'm taking your car out for some exercise. <laughs> just, you know. Yeah, the only thing my car ever did really was to and from work, to and from the grocery store, to and from the library. I mean, just running around town. He's, uh, then my car died, and I, I have my mom's old car, which was my brother's work car for years. So it's like rusted out and fallen apart and duct tape and vice most grips expensive and, lawn ornament. <laughs> Yeah, it's well it, it still runs. It still gets me from point A to point B and back again with a lot of prayer. But um I mean there are areas like under the dash where it's don't touch the vice grips. If you ungrip something, it's not gonna run. <laughs> don't pump it, don't grip it. Too funny. My last car, the the accelerator pedal pedal was held on by a bungee cord, so I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my my late husband had a truck one time that the ignition thingy broke in it, and so he jerry rigged it around so that you could put the key in it to make it look like you were starting it with the key, but in actuality, you had to reach under the dash, you had to flip two different switches, then you had to hit a button. And then flip two other switches and then hit a button and it would start. It was like this whole thing worked out, you know, between under the dash and a button that he had. On Why did the, you bother to put the key in? Just to make it look like to other people that there was a key to start it so that they didn't try to figure it out. You know, like if they see, you know, you know oh, oh, he did it oh. just as a thing that if somebody was. No in the same. car yeah they would they wouldn't know what he was doing and uh there's this old guy that used to sell metal and every week he would drive by our place and he'd swing in and stop and he asked my husband when are you gonna sell me my truck <laughs> my husband would be like no it's not for sale and he did that for about three or four months every week he would swing by when are you gonna sell me my truck he would call it and after about three or four months, he pulled in one time. My husband said, it's yours. Here. <laughs> See, that's why he was persistent. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, I hate to do this, Sherry, but we've been. We're an hour and a half in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I have to go. I have to get going. My Very husband's going to so. think well, I died up here. Coming <laughs> and, and just chit-chatting and sharing. and. It was very fun. I'm so Pleased that you asked me to come on and I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, you're uh, welcome back anytime. Oh, thank you. To do to that you want. I mean, I do. I have a few readers that do just political reads. We get together and we'll do those. And oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Lord knows there's plenty going on right now. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, well, the next time we start talking about doing something for a political, I'll shoot you an email. And okay, yeah. And give me plenty of warning because, like I said, I don't look at them every day. So <laughs> if you're trying to get a hold of me quickly, <laughs> don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for answering my email when I sent it to you. So oh, finally, right? You yeah, know, I screwed that up at the beginning. I'm so sorry I think I only that. sent you like two emails or something, and and I was really surprised when you answered. Like. Wow, it only took two emails. <laughs> There's some people I've emailed six or seven times. I only saw one. That shows you, and they get lost, you know. So yeah. Sorry, yeah. But, oh, well, huh? well, we'll do it again for sure. I really, really Absolutely. touched that you would ask me, and I had a really good time. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. I enjoyed just visiting and getting to know you. And I mean, I think like a lot of people, we uh, you see readers, but you don't know very much about them, really. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so yeah. it's I kind of well, like doing the, to anybody in Louisiana. There you go, when you're yeah. up north, so northwest, so you know, different different areas. Isn't it remarkable? We never would have met uh, if it wasn't for the exactly. internet. It's remarkable how you can be in contact with anybody anymore. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank I you. have really, really, really enjoyed your visit. And I do. I really appreciate it. Thanks.
You're welcome. I'm looking forward to the next episode. You and Denise are psychos and psychics. It's fabulous, you guys. You've got to watch. Well, it it's is, a little rough around the edges still. Especially if you're into that kind of stuff like I am. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I'm going to I'm gonna shoot an email to my buddy and see if he knows uh, yeah. Wes and if he can maybe give a boost. Give, so. him a, give him a nudge because, yeah. And if you know Margaret Atwood, tell her I'm looking for her. <laughs> if I find anybody <laughs> that knows her, I'll let you know. <laughs> Anyway, slung of oil. Slung <laughs> <laughs> of oil. Bonjour. Well, no, not by his. Uh, um, Bonjour. Bonjour is hello. And, um, um, well, crap. I'm going to get the goodbye. I'm going to say abiento. Yeah, adios. <laughs> abiento, like I'll, you know, see you later. Time. Yeah. Later, guys. <laughs> later, <laughs> usually, Gator. <laughs> I usually just say later, Gator, and be done with it. So, you know. I know very little Cajun French. I used to know it when I was a kid, but it's gone now. I keep saying I'm going to take a class and haven't done it. So I need oh, to relearn my, my language. Stay yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. You have yourself a wonderful rest of your week. And uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>